Yeah, test again. Seems to work better. Yeah, perfect. Hello, welcome to everyone. I'm Benjamin Wayen, so I'm the co-chair of the Up City, Space and Mobilities of Civis. I will rapidly explain you what's a hub in the Civis context. Uh, and I'm co-chairing this up with uh, Stefan Lang, which is also part of um, this uh, nice little event of today. So, you know Civis is a kind of, let's say, cooperation between universities in Europe. Uh, there is a lot of thing about student mobility, about uh, sharing experience in management of universities, but it's also very important to have some collaboration on the content, on the knowledge. And that's the job of the hubs. Uh, and the specificity of the, the apps is that they have to work on the edge of the different disciplines. So it's not disciplinary, it's interdisciplinary. So we try to have a look on the same topics by different point of view and collaborate. So that's the story and that's the role of the hubs. There are five of one and uh, this is one of those. So, how do we choose the topics of the hubs? Is to work on something that has a strong link with societal challenge. For example, uh, there is a hub about climate change, but our hub is about the question of cities, spaces, and mobilities. So everything happening in space, in cities, in the, this high mobility world, where cities are now the nodes of mobility. So we are gathering people from uh, urban planning, spatial analysis, also people speaking about digital, because today cities and spaces are also digital one. Also, of course, transport, mobility, uh, cultural aspects, uh, governance, because of course there are the politics of the cities, of the territories, but also the, the, we are gathering colleagues from sociology of migration, so there is a lot of people, but also people coming from what I will call art science, like uh, engineers, like uh, um, physicists. So the idea is also that the, the city is something built, the territory is something built, and that we have also to work together between humanities and what I would call natural and art science. So what we do, we meet and we discuss a lot. Sometimes we have some drinks to be more creative. Uh, but after that, we, 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 we work on, on two, two directions. First, where is it an interest to work together? Uh, with, discipline, di with different disciplines, but also with different research background. Because the epistemology of the different country in Europe is not the same. With science is also a cultural construction, and so uh, there is a, a strong interest to confront, to, uh, to um, make, gather together a uh, different approach of uh, the topic. So uh, we, we work on a lot of topics, but also if we have to be very pragmatic, we have to land on very practical projects, and for that we have different formats. And so always the big tricky thing is working on a good topic with the good formats to collaborate. So what are the, the formats? Uh, something is a BIP, which is a BIP, it's a blended intensive program. So it's you have uh, online course, and then you meet together in one city or in one place in Europe. We have MOOCs, massive open course. Uh, we have also new certificates uh, trying to, yeah, we take a little bit from my university, a little bit from a second one, a third one, and we make a, a very nice uh, course using Erasmus uh, classical or some customized uh, Erasmus practice, and sometime can go maybe in the future to John Master. Uh, we also work for PhD uh, with doctoral school, but also intensive things like uh, summer school, which is not just having party in the mountain, but also working on a very uh, interesting uh, scientific thing. We also do things very simple, just sharing a course, just sharing course material. Of course, sometimes you have to translate it, so it's not always so simple, even if you have to translate such strange word like territory, for example, which is not so easy in translating different words and have some different connotation in the different countries of Europe. We also work on um, course material, could be also a, a textbook. 
And also we try to go to classical things like a conference uh, uh, and session in a scientific events. Uh, also with the idea to not going there with uh, only colleagues from the academic, but also sometimes taking students with us. Uh, because students can also participate to a scientific conference, and I think that's also something we can uh, help to do with CEVIS. So the topic, there are a lot of them, uh, some of them more linked is to cities with their specific uh, demography, also the question of uh, the different evolution of cities in Europe, some are very dynamic, some of them are shrinking, try to disappear, but we also have these things in Europe. Uh, we have, of course, uh, different type of space, so the question of governance of it, you know, yeah, Germany is a federal state, also Belgium, so it is, it's one type of management of the, the space, there are more centralized management, so it's, it's always interesting to deal with that, there is also the question of the border, so a lot of space are near border, and of course people learn to use border, uh, so uh, could be interesting to, to frame it in this direction. Of course, there are a lot of mobilities, uh, mobilities, which is classical one, every day to day, uh, bike of uh, car commuting, but could be also the mobility of migration, of the mobility of worker. Also think about teleworking, then you go to a touristic place to work uh, with this new type of, uh, of uh, use of space. Uh, and of course, and generally it's a place we, we meet together with the colleagues because it's a very interesting exchange space is exchanging about methodologies between different disciplines to explore uh, the same topic. So that's the general framework uh, that we have. We have uh, some also tools uh, and one of the, the way of working on the different topic is this topic, making visible the invisible in cities and territories. There are a lot of things invisible, uh, for example, sometimes uh, could be homeless migrants, but could, could be also, also be animals, or uh, some IDs, or some um, information flows, or money flows that could be invisible, and we meet, or, yeah, maybe it's something we have to do uh, if we have to, 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 to pick us to put a special insight, could be very useful to transfer uh, methods and approach from one method, one from one discipline to other, or from one topic to another to explore this dimension. So, you see it's very broad, but there is strong background about how can we have a, a new view on cities, uh, on space, on mobilities, not being too framed by only one discipline, which is not so easy to do, uh, because our, our universities are very discipline uh, historically constructed, and so we are trying to, to do that, and yeah, it's sometimes easier to go uh, across disciplines uh, with a larger set of colleagues, and that's typically what are for uh, civis, and that's typically what we will uh, show a little bit today uh, about this question of landscapes, but for that I leave the floor to Olaf to present uh, the, ne the rest of the afternoon. Do you want that I put something, Olaf? No, no. go ahead. Just go ahead. Just go ahead. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But the next one will be Stefan, as I think. So the idea this afternoon was also to have a kind of topic that we can show different approach based on the same topics. And this topic is the landscape. Yes. And this, this we start with the presentation of Stefan. In people in need, lots of interesting pictures we will see, I know. And so, <laughs> let's start. Thank you. So, thanks a lot. So, you will see that this is a little bit, uh, well, specific angle that we put on migration. So, it's uh, forced migration. So, it's basically about forced um, displaced people or forced displacements due to conflicts, due to natural disasters, due to whatever. Um, and then if we talk about cities or settlements, then these are ephemeral, so meaning they are occurring and they are disappearing eventually. Um, some of them are there for many generations, others are maybe there for a couple of months. So it's about camps, refugee camps, refugee settlements, um, this 
uh, distributed all around the, the world. And this is a collaboration we do in particular, of course, with a uh, larger NGO that everybody's hopefully aware of, Médecins Sans Frontières, Doctors Without Borders, MSF, um, that are one of the largest humanitarian organizations worldwide. Um, and then this is also a collaboration with the University of Tübingen, um, in particular because of the, the precursor. So we're doing, um, uh, we had many projects developing these kind of things. Um, and, and tools that we nowadays, more or less operationally, that has, has be, is being used in, um, uh, for NGOs. But it also has an attitude towards what we call open lab, so it's a communication, it's something where university uh, developments which are occurring in the university will be actually spread out to society, um, to NGOs, to public authorities, you name it, everything outside academia, who can actually um, take use of this of these technology, and I think this is a um, quite an interesting example. So um, <clears throat> I don't want to bore you with, with, with uh, figures, but um, usually when we talk about refugees, I mean, it's, it's uh, a broad term, and we know we differentiate between refugees who are registered by UNHCR, who manage to cross the national border, and those who are internally displaced uh, within a country. And um, it's by far the biggest share of refugees or forced migrants um, who, are re who are displaced within uh, a national boundary, and they are not officially registered. So they are actually invisible. Yeah? Um, and so we try also to make these people visible in the sense that we are um, trying to analyze uh, their set the settlements, which are temporarily erected, as I said, um, and thereby um, supporting humanitarian organizations. So it's mainly about population estimation. We do this uh, through latest stage technology, basically satellite remote sensing, um, I don't want to bore you again with, with technical details here, but this is the way how we do this together with NGOs who are more and more adopting these new technologies. So it's not something we are doing like in academia and then we are giving this out. We're doing this together with, with the big players in the field, MSF, um, the Red, Red Cross organizations and many others. Um, so what's the advantage basically of this technology is that we have like an overview, we have the context, we have different scales, we can do um, objective measurements and at the same time of course we can uh, look deeper and, and having more detailed analysis. And of course we can do this in a, um, in a recursive way. Um, so it's, it's different information types that we're producing there based on, on satellite imagery according to the needs of, of NGOs that we will um, yeah, in the next couple of minutes, we will explore a little bit further. So it's all about the people, the people in need, those who are not registered on any official statistics, um, any, any official maps, all of these you won't find, or at least not immediately in Google Maps, because these are very recent, very high dynamic um, um, situations. Well, this is an example after the earthquake in, in Haiti in 2010 or between uh, 2010, where there was some dedicated um, uh, vaccination campaigns, and of course there is no um, census or no, no official records, and um, so we, we also managed to, to um, disaggregate these kind of population figures and make it very specific in order to um, improve this um, logistics. Maybe it's quite impressive how the settlement grows. This is a village, these are three villages in, in uh, Darfur region in Sudan after the last uh, uh, the full conflict, um, and you see these settlements uh, from above where, of course, uh, well, there's maybe a couple of thousand people living, but it grew over a, a few years into a huge settlement, which is actually like a metropolitan area, 130,000 people, so it's roughly the, uh, the population of Salzburg and, and similar cities. Um, so, and this is, of course, also an issue with the carrying capacity of the, of the space. Does it generate secondary conflicts um, and, and so on and so forth? So what are these um, supporting needs for humanitarians? Um, not going into detail, but in general, it is geospatial technologies that they are using nowadays for their logistic planning. Um, that means, of course, they have to deploy their, their humanitarian aid um, in terms of uh, vaccination, nutrition, food, water, and so on and so forth. And they have to do this, of course, in a careful way. Um, before we used this technology, of course, they did it just like through guessing or um, experience, but they can do this now in a much more um, better way. And there's a broad portfolio. We are, again, not going into that, everything, but you see that, that these kind of humanitarian um, needs or needs of humanitarian organizations, they can be served in many fold ways. 
Um, again, it's in conflicts, it's in natural disasters or responding to a uh, crisis, a health crisis, COVID. So the question was, for example, what we also did or what, what they demanded quite often um, is to assess excess mortality due to COVID in various places in these refugee camps because, of course, nobody had these figures. Um, and all these you can basically support uh, through geospatial technologies. This is one of the largest camps in the world. Um, you may have heard about the, the um, influx of uh, Rohingya refugees in 2016, where it was for a long, for long time, basically several months, it was not clear how many people uh, were aware, so there were no official figures uh, in that time, and it was, again, University of Tübingen <laughs> collaboration because it was a PhD that took place here of Andreas Braun, uh, who could for the first time use uh, radar technology in order to support um, uh, support humanitarian organizations even under bad weather conditions. So that's of course not another radar image, but this is a, um, a drone image of this large camp. But um, nowadays, of course, we know that these Rohingya um, refugee camps, they are yeah, uh, there for uh, many, many years and decades. And what we try is to bring things together and different technologies, of course, also on the ground um, intelligence. And I think the most, the highest, the highest capacity is in the, in the temporal aspect that we can actually observe things over time. So this is the growth of this um, Kutapalong camp, one of the largest refugee camps for, for Rohingya refugees. That has been there before, but that grows, that grew uh, in a high dynamic. Um, and, and of course, to understand this and to have like better awareness, this is also good, of course, for the, for the people who are in these camps. And of course, we are also doing um, this in collaboration with um, yeah, uh, organizations on the ground. Further issues and uh, further capacities in, in terms of monitoring, they also relate to disaster, uh, different types of disasters, affected population through um, floods and, and other uh, and droughts and other disasters. Um, maybe last slide here is um, something which is a little bit more complex, but it shows that it's so important to actually engage with NGOs and with local stakeholders um, in order to better understand really the measures that you're going to develop and the mitigation um, means. Um, so that means if you have this kind of uh, technology in hand, then of course you also have to think of specific information needs and what are the indicators and how these translate. Um, <clears throat> and this we usually do in a, a very collaborative and co-design approach whether it's uh, malaria prevalence and uh, some mitigation measures in terms of that or any other public health related um, issues or conflicts and crises. So all these um, are being co-designed and this is also what we're doing in our open lab setting um, and of course within the, the hub context. Okay, that was a bit of a rush, a lot of pictures as you, uh, as you rightly said, but we say, okay, we were 10 to, 10 to 12 minutes maximum. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doug. Doesn't work? Work? Yeah, fantastic. Thank you very much, Stefan. Because we are now moving more into a landscape context, in a deeper landscape context, I would like to ask you if you have uh, immediately some questions to Stefan Lang concerning this um, remote sensing projects and results and consequences. If not, it's not a problem. Yeah, we have. I, I will give you the microphone. Ah, fantastic. <laughs> I just wanted to make a little bit of sport. Does that work? Yeah. yeah. Okay, perfect. So um, maybe if we can go back to the slides on, um, on your camps. Um, I know, for example, um, so I'm doing my master's thesis, or not thesis, mémoire, comme est-ce qu'on dit ça en anglais? But voilà, my master's on, um, on, on uh, the migrants currently transiting through Belgium, mm -hmm. on usually their way to the UK. And um, so do you usually take sort of these kinds of images um, in, in 
sort of out of Europe contexts. So, you know, you've got Sudan, I saw Ethiopia, but for example, for metropolitan areas within Europe who have obviously migrants from other populations transiting, and I know there's a lot of camps kind of dotted around um, between Brussels and um, some of the departure points. Um, do you have that kind of data, and is that part of part of the process, or are you focusing more on um, on location mm. um, in the sort of outgoing countries where they're fleeing yeah. from? No, that's absolutely right. So usually, I mean, MSF is of course they work worldwide, and we follow somehow their traces or their demand. But uh, during this so-called refugee crisis that we had, which was not a real okay, it's my personal opinion, as compared to other cri refugee crises that we have in the world in 2015, 16. <laughs> Um, the camps in Calais, um, which was erected there spontaneously, and MSF was there, so we did this analysis in Calais. Yeah, so definitely, and well, it's a bit special to do this, and, and of course also in, in, in Lesbos and other, um, so we also work in Europe, or there work in Europe, uh, but the majority is of course in, uh, well, Sub-Saharan Africa and uh, Middle East and or Central Asia. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Further questions or comments? No. Yeah. Thank you very much for a, a fascinating talk. Um, I was wondering if you could say something uh, how you, through the hub, you already have connections to, to other civil universities regarding this, or are you planning to, to do something mm. and what in that case? Um, so we, we also have like a joint master which, um, well, existed before CIVIS or outside CIVIS, but uh, for the renewal of this Erasmus Mundus program, we have involved several CIVIS universities as associated partner, including also one African university. Um, and they're exactly, um, so one of the major thematic areas, which is, well, it's a generic, uh, it's, it's a master on, on how to use remote sensing and uh, geospatial technologies, but one of the main thematic areas is humanitarian action or geo-humanitarian action as we call it. So we have a lot of um, uh, interns and, and people who are involved and this of course will spread then through the, through the other university. It's a little bit in the future because this is still under evaluation, this renewal, um, but then we would have University of Bucharest, Tübingen anyway, uh, Macarriere and, um, and a few others. <laughs> Sorry, I was, <laughs> who was the last one? ULB, we were discussing, ULB, we are, we are, we are collaborating anyway in this, in this realm, um, and uh, yeah, a few others, okay. Thank you very much. I don't see that someone is, wants to say something, so we switch over to a more uh, focused uh, on, uh, topic on landscape. And now we are get, getting more and more in, uh, deeper in the topic of landscape. And um, the first uh, speaker of uh, the series of other speakers about scapes, uh, we switch to landscape and colonialism. And then we will go ahead to foodscapes. And now I give the... So, no? yeah, yeah, this no. one. Benjamin. So there, there are migration process in, in crisis, but uh, of course in the story of the world there, there was a lot of organized migration and one of those was the colonization. Uh, and so probably know this guy on his horse, uh, it's King Leopold II. And King Leopold II was the owner of Congo. That was not Belgium owning Congo. It was King Leopold II owning the Congo in a private way. So that was the story at this time. And so, of course, uh, there is a lot of statue of uh, Leopold II in Brussels because it was also king of the Belgian. But there is also a lot of other uh, symbol uh, linked to colonization in the public space in, in Brussels. You have here a map. And uh, of course, today, uh, there is a, a huge uh, contestation about the symbol of colonization. Uh, the head of the king is regularly uh, painted in red. Uh, there is also a statue in Ostend 
uh, where there are uh, some people cutting the hands of the statue, symbolizing one of the things that was done uh, also in Congo in the colonial area in the end of the 19th century when there were trouble uh, with the uh, local workers. Uh, and now there is also a, a huge demand, yeah, to maybe we have to do something with this temple. Oh, but the question is what? Uh, could be range from, let, let's say, eliminate them from the public space because they are, are problematic, to doing nothing. And of course, there are a lot of intermediate uh, action possible, uh, explain, add something, add a statue in front of it. So if you go there in, in Brussels, you turn, and you will be in, on the other side of the street in, in, in front of the statue of Patrice Lumumba, which is a way to putting uh, tension in the public space uh, about uh, the, the story and the past of the colonial uh, story of Belgium. But there is also a, a need for scientific research to better understand the different motto. And that's, I would not discuss the, the whole map, but there are different colors on the street of the map. And in fact, each color reflects a way to contribute to the colonization. You could be uh, an economic support because you are the owner of big company making uh, business there. Uh, you can be a religious people that were uh, go there to uh, change the religion of people there. Uh, you can also be a military, which is in fact the most hotspots, uh, which is around the neighborhood, the military or neighborhood of, of, of Brussels. And of course, in the time of colonization, if you want to go fast in the hierarchy of the army, you have to go to Congo. Uh, and so there is a lot of stories. And making these stories appear is also a way to explain how complex and how all the parts of the society uh, participate in different ways on, on the colonial process. And so also reveal the fact that it's not only a story of King Leopold II, but also a kind of uh, part of the society project that should be discon dis uh, disconstructed uh, very, very fast. And so uh, it's, very, uh, it's a very hard topic now in a in lot of cities in Europe, but also you have all this question about uh, uh, confederates in, in, in uh, North America. Uh, you have uh, the question with the Native Americans uh, in uh, Canada and other parts. So it's, it's become a real uh, question, but also with always a kind of local story and local context that should be uh, dealt. But of course, the question of the, and, and this is it's in fact statues, street names, uh, buildings, uh, part of the universities, uh, are a component of a kind of, let's say, symbolic landscapes where there is a lot of trace uh, of, of colonization remaining. And in fact, to be honest, very few of them are um, questioned today. Uh, they are questioned in, in the discussion, but not on the material side of the question. So we really have to go to that, to that way. But of course, the, um, the story of colonization is not only, and the colonial landscape, it's not only a story about uh, Brussels and this monument. You should also have a view on Congo, of course. There is also a statue of King Leopold II in, in, in the Congo. There are a lot of them. But also, uh, and what is interesting, because the question arises when discussing about uh, different topic about foodscape, so the, the, the link between the production of food uh, with, uh, with Olaf. Uh, but of course, part of the colonization was to, to, uh, to gather products and food products and transform the economic system of the colonies to produce foods. And in fact, maybe the, the largest part, if we count in, in hectares, and in, in imprints on the surface of the earth of the effect of colonization is the change in agricultural and food systems, which remains still today. And one big example with the Congo is the oil palma. You know, uh, there is oil palma everywhere in the food. Uh, we try to avoid it, but in fact, uh, also for biocarbon. But you have to know that the, 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 the large part of the work of colonization of Congo by Belgians was the extracting of oil palma and the managing of it uh, with big companies, one of them being Lever, which became Unilever 
still existing uh, today. Uh, and uh, of course, there was a landscape. And this landscape was, was studied by, by a former colleague of mine, which is uh, Henri Nicolai, uh, who wrote, I, I think, one of the best articles about the story of the oil palm. It's in French, but with DPL, it's your friend today, so you can translate it. Uh, and uh, what it was really a story because he, he was uh, the assistant professor of Pierre Gourou. And Pierre Gourou is a well-known French uh, geographer, which is what, one of the first, let's say, professor uh, of, um, let's say, South geography, uh, working largely in Bordeaux and Brussels, uh, ending his career in Brussels. But just after the Second World War, at the moment, there were well, well, the university system was questioning the colonization. And really, there is a kind of heritage. But it was questioning the colonization, knowing very well the colonization because they work for it. It was a kind of very specific. And so we, this man was a, was a library. He dies, so we lose the library. He lost uh, two years ago, just before the COVID. Uh, but he, he tell us a lot of the story, he let us a lot of archive, and he tell us the story of the old Palma uh, in Congo, revelating all the landscape of Congo it was transformed by the old Palma and the old system. And you can do a lot of time this story about caoutchouc uh, in Brazil, uh, in a lot of space, also because it reveals the question also of the, the it's not only making place where you cultivate or you may grow uh, palma because what was the case in Congo, it was also thing gathering in the forest. Uh, and so the, the question of exploiting the, the, the forest and the relation and things like that. And so he shows us all the story. Uh, and, and also today there is a, an industrial landscape remaining in Congo, uh, linking to that, but also an economy uh, that remains about that, but also a very questioning of the fact that uh, decolonization also um, was, was not accompanied, and so uh, a real economic resource disappeared from Congo. For example, Congo was the, f the first of the second exporter of oil palma in the middle of the, the 20th century. Today, they don't export oil palma from Congo. They, they have a lot of consummation uh, on place, but in fact, it, it's not a, a resource that uh, gives money to the state of Congo and to the industry in Congo today. And so it's, it's really questioning, because when it was Belgian, it was making money, and now today. So, and, and all the industries and all what was managed. And you have real region, and you see the hotspots uh, on, on Quilu, a region where, in fact, it's, it's like an old industrial district, like uh, Ruhr of uh, uh, Wallonie could be, uh, of Congo, big, but it's, it's, it's an industry in the forest, and all the remains of the oil industry in the forest. And now it's the question of, uh, maybe for Congo, uh, the, the, the management of the trees and heritage of colonization, is, is, is not what we have on the point of view of Europe, so dealing with symbols and things like that, but dealing with the remain of this colonial economy and how to deal with it. Is it heritage? Do we need to uh, reuse it? And so you see that the questioning about traces and, and, and remaining landscape on, on colonization could be very different on the, on the both sides, and that was that is also a thing we want to, to deal with, uh, with CVs and with uh, partners uh, in different universities in different sides of Africa, is also to try to, to build some uh, a, a kind of global uh, reflection about uh, post-colonial landscape and the effect of colonization on landscape, but having point of view from the north, from the south, and also trying to, to create a more integrated uh, knowledge about uh, colonial landscape and not only a north-based problematic colonial landscape approach. So that's all I want to say to you. Thank you very much. Very interesting <laughs> insights to your topic <laughs> and our topic as well. I see the first question, right? Uh, yeah, I don't know if I missed that, but I didn't quite get why the palm oil is now not a resource anymore that is not exploitable. 
Oh, in fact, all palma is still exploited in, in Congo, but only for uh, local markets because right. they, they, to be honest, the, the industrial structure uh, go down and they go back to a, a more classical uh, artisanal way of producing it. Uh, but they maintain the the, 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 the amounts, uh, but maybe probably in exploiting more the, um, the wild uh, palma more than the, uh, the growing one, which is also a questioning question of uh, ecological system and things like that. And so, uh, but it, it remains, so they are not dependent from the rest of the world for palma oil, they are quite independent, but they didn't uh, manage to gain money that can serve for other things, which, which was the case at the Belgian time colonization. So it's, it's, it's also okay. we can say, yeah, it's, it's nice because they are autonomous for that. So they don't make money about that in the globalized world. Could be herbs, but it's, it's just seeing someone. And also the fact that they, the, 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 the relief, the industrial landscape is, is no more heritage than something that can be used. And maybe they more need a real use of it than an heritage position of it. And so that, that's some time questioning. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Further questions or comments? No? Thank you very much, Benjamin. And it fits quite good that I'm standing here because I'm the next one. Uh, my, my name is Olaf Kühne, Tübingen University, but uh, as you can uh, see as well, um, Department of Geo Sciences, um, Urban and Regional Development, and um, oh, I'm also the chair of uh, the German Academy of Regional Geography, and so it is very important for me uh, to think about regional geography, especially because regional ge geography um, de had, had a decline of, uh, um, uh, of meaning in uh, especially German, but also international geography, the synthetic view to what we call regions or landscapes or something like that, um, declined uh, in the last 30 years, uh, also because of uh, uh, the specialized geographies always told us um, that we have had no um, a theoretic foundation, and so one of our topics uh, in our working group is to bring back um, uh, synthetic geographies um, into the theoretical geographical context. And uh, now I, I'm, I know uh, I destroy the good mood uh, talking about theories. Um, so, but, but only 10 minutes, so it's uh, not so, so complicated for all of us. So I start with uh, a neo-pragmatic uh, approach to foodscapes. Foodscapes is a topic uh, uh, we have a special view to. It started uh, with Timo, he started with this topic, and uh, then we started discussing about uh, the connection of foods and scapes uh, to foodscapes. And um, we try to uh, bring a foundation to this uh, topic, uh, also theoretically. And now I will start with a theoretic background, or our version of a theoretic uh, uh, synthetic ba uh, background for foodscapes, as well as uh, regional geography as, as, as uh, well, in general. And then we go more and more into practical details. Then Timo will talk about the history of the concept of foodscapes. And then we, have, we will have two de more detailed views uh, of one of uh, a participant of uh, one CIVIS project. Um, Julia will talk about um, her contribution um, to this project and then we, we um, have the um, end of our small food skate session with, Lil with Liliana. She will talk about also the results of this foodscapes project um, in the civic context. So, um, I already mentioned the problems of uh, regional geography or the synthetic view. The one thing, we have a very complex um, object of investigation, landscapes, regions, uh, urban areas as well. We, we have problems to um, use only one theoretical perspective uh, to make a synthetic investigation. 
Um, so the question is how we could integrate uh, several the theoretical backgrounds. And uh, so we, searched, we were searching for meta theory and we found it in um, neopragmatism, found it especially by uh, Hilary Putnam and especially uh, Richard Rorty uh, in a philosophical way in the tradition of uh, pragmatism, but on a more um, linguistic level, on a more uh, uh, level focused on social constructivism um, and uh, the possibility to use this uh, theoretical background um, is, ha is to have a broader uh, triangulation between different theories um, and different methods as well. What is important in this way of thinking is not to find the only single truth. This is typical for essentialism. We, we refuse in our uh, not only project in this worldview, um, because um, the first thing, it, it produces uh, a special way of thinking that is, there's only one truth. And um, the idea of neopragmatism neo is to re-describe something, to make clear the contingency of knowledge. Um, and uh, the aim is to find out things um, which are suitable, which help us to understand the world and with give, which are giving um, uh, ideas to manage with, with uh, recent problems. So, what is a f the redescription? The first is um, uh, the redescription has to be suitable to interpret the world better than ancient uh, vocabularies. Ancient vocabularies we can understand as the theories we often describe, landscapes, regions, and so on, for example, positivism, or also classical uh, constructivist positions, which only, I will show you a small um, figure as well, we, which are only to, able to um, uh, enlighten some special aspects of this com complex object. The second one is uh, to understand, to, to reflect contingency that the world uh, uh, has different views and uh, there are lots of interpretation or some interpretation with might, uh, fabric, um, fitting, suitable redescriptions. And so this is a classical um, worldview also can be found uh, in uh, Karl Popper's Open Society and its enemies from uh, 1946, the, the spotlight theory that you need more theoretical, or the cl com more complex the uh, object is, the more perspectives you need to understand it. And our consequence in our project, project as well as um, our way of doing uh, science in, uh, in our working group is uh, to have six levels of triangulation. The first I already talked about is uh, uh, theory triangulation. Um, to combine different theories, but uh, you have to understand um, the way how they work and how they are, can be defined and it, it's de derived from the thematic focus and uh, so you have to reflect first which theories you can use, but the, the research process is a hermeneutic one, so you always test and uh, think about if your theories of your methods and so on are still working and still help you to give a, fi uh, a fitting result. The other triangulations are method triangulation for sure, um, to use different methods combining to investigate these complex objects as, for example, landscape, and for sure we're switching now to foodscapes, to foodscapes because it's very, um, it's maybe much more uh, complex than only landscape because you have uh, one side, the, the landscape tradition with their uh, theories of positivism, uh, social constructivism, radical constructivism, discourse theory, actor network theory, critical theory, I, I cannot tell all, all of, uh, of them right now. And you have the connection to food, the production, distribution, um, and consumption of food as well, and their spatial um, complex relations. So these different methods are pre pre producing different data, uh, which we have to combine. Uh, the best is to have different researcher uh, perspective from different disciplines, from different ages, from different stage of career, um, different gender, and so on. 
um, and as well as different perspectives. And now we can see it's not only inter um, uh, disciplinary, but all, um, also transdisciplinary, this idea to integrate perspectives of people who are living, uh, have to live in special uh, spaces, uh, uh, special landscape, how they experience the landscape, um, the region as well. And what is very important at last, um, the representation, especially cartographic representations, we are geographers. And uh, we, we love uh, maps and uh, we communicate our knowledge and our ideas with maps. And um, so it is important to um, show, to create new representations. And these representations should be designed like this, that they are showing the cont contingency of the topic. And the cont contingency of the topic um, uh, is a deviation from Richard Rorty's uh, contingency of self-society and language, which means, in, which means in our context, in the geographical context, um, uh, we know that uh, what we know about the world, uh, the spatial world, uh, is based on individual as well as um, social constructions, um, but also the ling linguistic cons representa uh, uh, representation means that also the representations we are producing about the world are so, uh, socially constructed and they are bounded by power. Um, and so we have to reflect how we could um, produce representations in an ironic way. And this irony, the spirit of irony, helps us to make clear the contingent, uh, cont contingent view to the world we construct in geography as well as other um, social sciences. So if you have questions for this presentation, um, please ask or comment, but I think it might be more clearer what I meant when we, when we switch over to Timo, who will go more in detail, uh, details about f the topic and f of foodscapes and its, its history. Thank you very much. So, okay, my task now is to bring back the good mood <laughs> in the room. Well, let's see. Should be easy. I mean, I'm mainly talking about such joyful topics like inequality, poverty, and so on. So, maybe <laughs> let's see. Well, as Olaf has mentioned, um, I'm working on food topics for almost 15 or more years now. I started doing so, writing my PhD in 2007, starting from 2007 on. And my PhD was on Tafeln. This is a special type of food bank in Germany and also established in Austria and Switzerland. Uh, they were founded in 1993 in Germany. And that was my point, starting to doing research in terms of food, all kinds of food, and of course linked to poverty and, well, first thing is why food? Why foodscapes? Um, these are some short articles of German newspapers and German news blogs and so on. Um, I will not uh, translate them complete, but the first one says this, there's a traumatic rise of clients of the Tafel. Um, I would not call them uh, clients. Here it says Nutzer, this is the German word for user, and I will also call them user because uh, within this Tafel system, there's many rights which are not for the people using the Tafel. Yeah? Because with the term clients, certain rights are involved and they are not in the Tafel. Uh, the second one is um, the topic that the small supermarkets in Germany more and more declined. And in the, uh, not urban, but rural areas, it's kind of problematic because also the uh, public transport system is getting a little cut down in certain areas. And the third is talking about the problematic situation for many people because of uh, Ukraine war, for example, but there's been also other uh, reasons for the rise of the costs of living. 
because all the prices for uh, food were rising and that is very problematic because this means that food insecurity is getting more and more spread. And this is, well, it looks quite funny, but actually I'm not sure if you've heard of, but well, Germany is always bad in the Eurovision Song Contest, but in the European Championship to be the fattest country in Europe, we are quite, yeah, well, we are challenging Great Britain, but we are, sometimes we are European champions, sometimes wise European champion. So, and it's also connected to, um, to the states in Germany and, well, these are the state of the, the states of the former GDR, so German Democratic Republic, and as you can see, the rates for obesity measured by a body mass index above 25 is the highest in those regions. And these are also the regions where the income the lowest in Germany. So you could think of correlation. Well, I'm not sure if there's always a causality to it, but at least the correlation between being fat and being poor could be. So you see, there are many more reasons why you should maybe uh, handle with the topic of food and foodscapes. These are just some points that I wanted to mention. And uh, um, the scientific debate about food is very old. It's actually more than 200 years old. Um, the geographers in the room maybe have heard of Thomas Malthus, yeah, because he was um, very famous for his model um, bringing issues of carrying capacity of Earth um, into scientific debate. And then, of course, Thunen, almost 200 years. Now, he was talking about the best production sites for, spe for specific agricultural use. And in the 20th century, then, I'm going to refer on Simmel. Maybe you've heard of Simmel, famous German sociologist and riches, and of course, uh, Bronislav Malinowski, maybe some of you are working on functionalism, heard of. He was and is still quite famous for his work uh, in the Southern Seas. And they were always focusing on the cultural dimension of food in their work. And Levi Strauss, maybe you've heard because he's the founder, I would say, for structuralism, and uh, he was focusing on the identity forming function of food. And this is also a topic which is still quite interesting and where research is needed. And then in the social sciences, there were some certain turns in the 80s, maybe mm, yeah, most of them in the end of the 1980s. Maybe you've heard of a uh, linguistic turn, spatial turn, for example, cultural turn, and also there was a culinary turn, which was, uh, for example, one famous researcher was Sidney Mintz, and in the field of geography, we had this agricultural geography for a very long time. And then in the end of the 1980s, Peter Atkinson, uh, sorry, Peter Atkins, uh, said that, uh, in my opinion, very famous uh, sentence. He said, agricultural geography is dead. Long live the geography of food. And what does he meant saying so? Uh, he was saying that there's really a lot of topics which were not included in the old agricultural geography. Like, for example, what is with the incorporation of food? What does it with our health? And so on. These questions were never asked in geography. And so he was the first who asked those questions, and so for me, he's quite important. And, but also not only in geography, and also in our neighboring social sciences, um, there was a lot of food studies in these times, also in the term of agro-food studies. Agro-food studies mainly f uh, focused on more quantitative side, and I would say food studies more on qualitative dimensions. And yeah, what was 
different or new was that we are now looking for the whole food system and looking at the entire value chain. And of course, as in every sub-discipline in geography, there's also a critical food studies, and not only in geography, but also in, uh, yeah, I would say in most of the other social sciences. And what is their common point is the critique of existing production structures. Well, for example, we have heard from Benjamin about this palm oil, and this could be a topic, of course, but there's other topics. I can also show you uh, on one slide a picture about uh, Almeria in Andalusia, in southern Spain, where this is also um, a big topic. So, what are foodscapes? Um, you can answer it very easy and very quickly by just saying it's an emulsion of food and landscape, of course, <laughs> as you will recognize. You get a more um, sophisti sophisticated uh, definition by Julia afterwards, I've seen on her slides, and so I will not give them to you. <laughs> so it's coming pieces by pieces. <laughs> and of course, uh, this term has its origins in the mid of the 1990s, and it was founded um, also in Great Britain, also within the same time as the food desert debate started in Great Britain. Food deserts are urban areas where it's not possible for people living there to have access to healthy and fresh food. This was a, quite a big topic in the mid and end 90s in Great Britain. And then it also became a topic in the United States. Well, this uh, has to do with also the former, uh, what is it, first lady, uh, Michelle Obama, because she was also the uh, founder of the campaign, Let's Move. And she was referring to food deserts and said that the uh, aim or the goal of this campaign is to eliminate all food deserts in the United States. Well, and then comes the first critical aspect to it. If you say you want to eliminate all those food deserts, then you assume that they are existing. Yeah, right? But do they? Well, it depends, I would say. It depends. If you are thinking you can measure it, then you are probably think, uh, thinking of like walking distance and so on, and then you can say, well, if there's a supermarket and in the United States, I'm not sure if everyone here has been to the United States, but what is typically, well, there's a central business district, which is not in a good shape <laughs> these times, and all the supermarkets have left the inner cities and go like on the outer rim of the cities, and for example, in greater shopping malls, and so on, and then if you're living in the downtown, then it's not possible to get by food, uh, by feed, uh, to a supermarket. So this is a topic in the United States, and then I ask myself, could this also be a topic in Germany? Well, I'm not the only one asking this question. One of my colleagues uh, made research on it in Schleswig-Holstein. This is the northern state of Germany, and he did it in the rural areas. So. Maybe it could be a topic also in Germany, but I'm not too sure, because I'm not that much uh, into thinking of food deserts as something that you can measure. I think maybe Olaf and me are neighbors. We are actually not, but think of it. And then it could be that Olaf is not living in a food desert because he has more money than I have, at least a little. <laughs> <laughs> And maybe he's in better shape and can go to the supermarket, which is two miles away and so on. Yeah, you can see he's in better shape, of course. <laughs> yeah. And so I think it's a very individual uh, question if you are living in a food desert or not. And you can't say it in an objective way. And all this stuff can be asked or analyzed from a constructivist perspective but also, of course, from a positivist perspective. And why is that? 
because, of course, foodscapes contain a material dimension, thinking of supermarkets and where they are located, as well as a cultural and discursive dimension, thinking of um, maybe eating habits. They are very individual. It could be that you are vegetarian and then there's like fast food shops, and, but they have only meat and so on, and then maybe you're living in a food desert. And also because when you think of fast food restaurants, then there was a problem in the United States, of course, where the former supermarkets have been located, who comes next? Fast food restaurants. And would you think of healthy and fresh food, thinking of fast food restaurants? Probably not, I think. And so, well, that's the question. And you can put it all together, and I think Clary did it in a very good way. And so I'll present it to you. This model of the foodscape use, maybe some of you are working on uh, terms and theories within like uh, mm, the vulnerability aspects of something, no? Because then it could be quite familiar to you because what you can see is the foodscape and what does the foodscape influence and how does the foodscape influence you as an individual and your home area and so on. You think of the axis Access is dependent on certain things. I think Liliana will also talk about access, so I will not do it in a proper way, but just to give you a short impression, maybe by your income and also by your uh, uh, physical ability and so on. And costs, of course, how cheap or how expensive is food. And then uh, by using this foodscape, you also change the foodscape. For example, thinking of gentrification processes, if there are more and more wealthy, econom in an economic way, wealthy people uh, moving to your uh, uh, city quarter, then of course also the foodscape changes. Yeah, thinking of, well, more like delicatess restaurants and so on uh, establishing, and then it, something changes. And this could also change you in a way. And of course, you are also influenced by your background, by your parents and so on, because all your food habits are starting to be getting very strong when you're very young. And if you have ever tried to change your habits in way of eating, then you know how difficult it is. So, short critical reflection. What is indisputable, I think foodscapes contain physical objects. I mean, of course in our working group, we are all social constructivists and very much in favor of social constructivism. But I think also we have to admit there are physical objects that you can measure. <laughs> Well, we are all more in qualitative data than in quantitative data, but of course, foodscapes include both. <coughs> Sorry. Um, there's also a spatial arrangement and that enables or prevents certain actions. So if you have to use a car, for example, because the distance is too far and so on. And all those consequences become visible on all spatial scale levels. And this is my uh, connection maybe to Benjamin and also to Stefan, because here are some pictures, I've taken them in Almeria, and when you are on Google Earth and looking on this area of Almeria, it's also called uh, Mar del Plastico, because what you can see from space is like all those stuff here, so it's on Google Earth, it's just a more or less wide <laughs> area. And this is the place where most of the um, vegetables in Europe are produced, and also fruits. And where and under which conditions are they produced? Well, and there's the link maybe to post-colonialism. They are still produced mainly by migrants from Central and Northern Africa, and also from Romania 
because uh, I've also talked to agricultural uh, farmers there in these regions and they say that the Romanian workers, they, um, they are better to understand because the Romanian language is very close to Spanish language. You can correct me, but this is what they are saying. So it's easier to understand them. And yeah, but the working conditions, they are quite bad. I mean, it's not a regular job. They are standing there on the streets in the morning waiting that someone is coming and carrying them to the field and that they can work for a day. So very bad conditions. And this is the thing, how most of the food, vegetables at least, and fruits, are produced in Europe and we consume it every day. I mean, you probably buy ecological food or, and so on and so on, but also in Almeria, more and more of the food is uh, produced in an ecological way. So that doesn't mean anything. Yeah. And so I'm speaking about this in this term. It's very important for me, the global sense of food. So every action that we do also as a consumer is responsible for things that are happen globally. Yeah, I'm thinking of time, but thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, so maybe this is my most important statement. Everything we do has consequences and potentially worldwide, as you can see with the palm oil that was former mentioned. So I'm coming to my advertising block at the end. <laughs> And as you have seen within our uh, CIVIS project about foodscapes, uh, in preparation of this uh, CIVIS project, Olaf, Corinna and me wrote a small essential about foodscapes, where everything important about foodscapes you will find there. And after our foodscapes project, we have also an anthology yeah, done by lots of people, as you can see. And there you find all this project. And one of these projects, will be presented by Julia today. Yeah. So, but, yes. of course, if you have questions. If you have questions, please ask. Or you can ask questions or give comments after the presentations as well, because we are a little bit short in time. It's possible also after the next two presentations to ask, because then we have perhaps a little bit time. OK, yeah. so a small. Mm -hmm. Geography of food, yeah. Geography of food. Mm -hmm. uh, one critique, maybe. Yeah. Uh, use the the maps. Use the the like Tunens Ringe or something like that because that explains, no? Good. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I should have uh, shown yeah, in, them in the, in the slide. Yeah. Ah, okay. I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. You see, I mean. I put the slides together, to be honest, and then normally I present them to like geography students and they know, of course, all know Thunen and so on. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Now we switch over to a person who will really give a good mood to us. Um, also because uh, of her topic, um, it is a student project in the context of the Foodscapes pro project. Julia, you could come <laughs> and uh, you could show what we have done in the CVIS project and it's also one of the contributions to um, the anthology which, which will come out, I think, in, in August, it is uh, announced. So, thank you very much and it's your audience. Okay, thank you. Um, so, I was one of the students in the CVIS course um, with the topic of foodscapes. And um, me and my fellow student Sven Gerstlauer, we conducted a little um, research project on the regionalization of sausage salad. And as you can see, <laughs> it's a traditional dish with um, the main ingredient, sausage. And they have uh, different um, variations, um, which are also ascribed to different regions, such as Swabia, Bavaria, also Alsace in France, and um, on another scale, Swiss. And, um, uh, and, um, 
As you might have experienced if you're from southern Germany or here from Swabia, um, there are some polarizing everyday discussions about the right way um, of sausage salads. And um, so we thought that would be the perfect research object to investigate the re uh, discursive production of regionality, uh, regionality of um, a dish because we experienced such discussions. The main concepts we um, draw upon were um, the foodscapes concept of um, Nora McKendrick, um, who says, consider the spaces and places where you acquire food, prepare food, talk about food, and gather some meaning of food, um, from food, this is your foodscapes. And we conducted our research on an online recipe platform. It's a German platform called chefkoch.de. And um, uh, there is also the possibility to share recipes um, by the users and also the possibility to um, comment on those recipes. And we thought this is a place where you gather some sort of meaning from food and talk about food. So um, as a uh, we already mentioned, um, um, we draw this from a social constructivist perspective and um, focused on the discursive production of meaning of the dish. And um, often associated with, um, uh, in, in uh, the communication of, um, about food, um, you can observe um, that it's evaluated in the concept of authenticity. And um, we figured that region, uh, regionalization, uh, we figured based on the work from uh, Johnston Bauman that regionalization um, is a communicative practice of producing such authenticity. And um, so ascribing a region as a way, um, would be a way of authenticating this um, dish as original or being true to its nature, um, which refers to an essentialist idea of um, truth. Um, and uh, so Johnson and Baumann not only um, showed that the regionalization or um, being uh, or the element of geographic specificity, a specificity is um, one way to create and establish authenticity, but also um, uh, simplicity, personal connections, and historicism, which we all found in our little research project. And, um, but they also um, uh, found in their examination of gourmet uh, food um, uh, journals um, that uh, magazines that um, geographic specificity is the most common discourse of practice to make a dish authentic. So um, Sven and I conducted the research, um, as I already mentioned, on the online recipe platform chefkoch.de, where you can share recipes, comment, and also like them. And we focused on the, most, uh, on the five most common variants of those uh, of sausage salad and um, uh, with three recipes each. And in total, we had about roughly 1,000 comments, which we classified. Um, and the most common uh, classification was uh, positive feedback and suggestions for improvement. But for us, uh, most important were those 130 comments um, with regional reference. Um, and those were our findings. As you can see, we um, translated them into a little map, and um, this map uh, shows our findings, um, which um, ingredient or which uh, um, how uh, those variations were, were characterized. Um, the signatures, symbols are the characteristic ingredient, and the size of the signature symbol um, refers loosely to the relevance um, of the um, variation in the discussions. And as you can see, most of it happened between, um, um, uh, was regarding the Swiss, uh, Swiss sausage salad and the Bavarian sausage salad, which uh, also made like 110 of the 130 comments. Um, so we found that, um, the um, that uh, regionality was discursively produced via the regional ascribed products as an ingredient. For example, um, for the variation, for the Swabian sausage salad variation and the Nuremberger sausage uh, variation, uh, salad variation, there was just a specific sausage that was put in and so the regionality was clear um, for those uh, variants. And, um, and in other versions, there was um, the preparation, certain preparation rules that made it um, 
uh, regionally specific or at least that was how it was um, communicated. Uh, for example, for the Bavarian version, um, there was uh, an insisting that the sausage, sausage should be sliced and not diced. Uh, diced and not sliced. And um, also what we found was that um, the regionality was not um, only enfor uh, enforced by, um, exclusively by um, being ge geographically specific, but also um, by other discursive strategies that align with the elements um, to construct authenticity that I already mentioned. So they draw on historic um, uh, stories or historic uh, tradition, um, and uh, also um, they had like the tendency to draw stereotypic, uh, stereotypical landscapes, pictures to um, also undermine their position. And also, um, they procla proclaimed like family origin um, in a, uh, to create a sense of um, higher uh, meaning and higher uh, position in the discourse. And also, yes. And um, what we could also found, and I didn't expect before, that um, the Bavarian and Swiss sausage salad, which um, was the most interesting discussion between, um, also contained an idealized self-image um, from the German side. It's also a German um, platform. And um, this, this uh, idealized self-image was also reinforced by the uh, platform mediator, who was there to mediate in discussions, but actually took the side um, that uh, it would be okay to stigmatize the Swiss version because um, the Swiss, uh, Swiss um, users of the platform said that they find it stigmatizing um, if they, their uh, nation was reduced to cheese. <laughs> um, and uh, in, uh, what was also interesting and um, closes um, what we found was the co-constitution of the peculiarity of the dish and the region. So it was not only that um, the, the dish was um, specified um, by saying it's a Bavarian version or a Swabian version, but also the region, which was um, mm, uh, but also the region was um, reproduced like a given. Yes. Okay. <laughs> That was it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Do you have questions? As you can see on the map at this time, uh, Salzburg wasn't already a partner in our CVIS network, so we have uh, Innsbruck on the map, and uh, now in the next version of the map, we have to remove it and to replace it by Salzburg. Okay, now we, 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 next time we, we see the project, we'll go to the next stage. Do we, have, do we have some questions? Because we are a little bit hanging in time, but uh, if you have a question, please ask or comment. Perhaps you have a special knowledge about sausage salad. If not, I, we will switch over to um, one uh, of uh, our project partners. In our project, we were working together with uh, not only Rome and Madrid, but, uh, very important, with Bucharest, and I'm very happy that uh, uh, Liliana is here to give uh, some impressions from the results of um, the Romanian students. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I, So, uh, to summarize what already had mentioned here, uh, foodscape uh, are very complex concepts. It has various forms and various perspective. Uh, of course, in a simplistic manner, it means uh, connection between food and landscape. Or... Um, food and its spatial uh, relationship. But I uh, have to mention it is not, uh, the concept is not limited to the physical space, to the spatial approach. 
um, foodscape uh, could be approached in a uh, more social and cultural perspective, in uh, uh, behavioral perspective, in economic and uh, political perspective, because uh, uh, finally, uh, food uh, consumption and food uh, production has a significant uh, influence on our health, on our uh, uh, environment. However, as a geographer, I tend to, to focus on special, on physical space. Uh, uh, Considering the uh, spatial approach, uh, uh, food environment and uh, foodscape could means could be similar, which is not the same for other approaches. Uh, food in environment has many dimensions, as food availability, which refers to the presence or absence of different sources of uh, uh, food. Uh, food accessibility, uh, which uh, relate to the distance and travel time to uh, food outlets. Food affordability, which refer to prices of products, or uh, many other related to vendor or product pro properties or marketing uh, uh, regulations. Uh, but uh, today I would not dwell uh, uh, on the concepts, but uh, on the way they were already applied within a project uh, developed uh, um, uh, by Ford uh, Civis University, and in which uh, students uh, from Faculty of Geography uh, from Bucharest University was uh, uh, involved as well. Uh, there were 10 students from the Faculty of Geography and two teachers. Um, there were some challenges in implementing this project from our side because although the concept is uh, well studied in literature, in um, uh, Romania, uh, geographers have paid less uh, attention to this subject. So there was a challenge for students and teachers to uh, approach and to focus on this uh, new topic. But this represents, uh, in the same time, opportunity for students uh, to address uh, a challenging and less uh, studied topic in Romania, to connect with other students uh, and teachers from different universities, to interact, unfortunately, only online, and change idea with their peers from other university, uh, and to work together uh, on similar subject and case studies, and finally to share experience uh, on uh, foodscapes. Uh, they uh, uh, tend uh, also to, to focus on spatial uh, approaches. So they choose uh, uh, topics such as spatial distribution of uh, food outlet, uh, physical distance to supermarket or uh, accessibility of supermarkets, um, availability of food in close proximity uh, uh, on uh, rural and urban areas uh, and in Bucharest, but also uh, some of them focus on social and cultural approaches uh, uh, on availability and affordability uh, of healthy food on student community in, uh, environment in uh, Bucharest or on uh, a subject such food choice or changes of uh, food cho uh, uh, choices uh, uh, in student community in the uh, University of uh, Bucharest. Uh, the most important are the results. The results, uh, uh, the most important are the publication. So uh, uh, students were uh, able to publish their research and form as a chapter in uh, Springer, which uh, Olaf mentioned is uh, in press, which is very good for uh, further uh, PhD uh, candidate, for example. And uh, uh, another uh, uh, important thing, uh, a new, the idea of a new project emerged, Tourscapes, uh, 
which is a little bit related to, to foodscapes because tourism and hospitality uh, have always been uh, 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 closely uh, related to gastronomy, to, to food, and also food experience uh, uh, occur in different organized or unorganized uh, 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 food encounters. Um, the objective of this new project will be the development and the implementation of the research project um, by students and write uh, uh, publishable articles uh, for an anthology about tourist scapes. Uh, we had already the 26 students from four university. Uh, they will come uh, to Bucharest uh, uh, as a research area and uh, they will find uh, uh, different research topics uh, uh, in Buc during their field trip in, in Bucharest. And uh, uh, they will do uh, uh, field research uh, uh, in uh, Bucharest. And finally, uh, we are hoping they will be able to publish uh, their uh, results. So there are only some uh, important results uh, I uh, would like to, to share uh, with you. And uh, uh, also I'd like to, to, to thanks uh, to the team from uh, uh, Tübingen uh, for the idea and for all the, the support in this project. Uh, thank you. Thank you as well. It was a great pleasure to work with you. And it is still because uh, it's going on uh, and in the Tourist Scapes project as well, uh, Foodscapes will be also uh, an, one important topic. So we are getting to the end of our um, session today. If you have questions, comment, wishes, hopes, please let me know or let us know. I have a look. Now everybody is hungry, I think. So, thank you very much. Um, I think we had, uh, you had an uh, impression about what is possible uh, when we are working together in our uh, CIVIS network. Um, we saw lots of open questions concerning food, foodscapes, uh, the connection to touristscapes and uh, um, the further meaning of the topic. And perhaps uh, if you're interested, uh, you can uh, go deeper into the topic of foodscapes and uh, especially and for in gen more generally with landscapes as well. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you all of my colleagues uh, to be here and give uh, some impressions of uh, your work. And uh, I think we will see each other again and have a nice rest of the day. Thank you very much. Thank you.